Deception Group. Now, uh, what he's going to talk about today will be the rise and fall of information security in the Western world. And to quote his words, right? You are invited to join him in not a speech, but a verbal odyssey, okay? Back to the beginnings of each of these all important cultural developments, how directly and indirectly um, the dark hacker underground and the computer security industry, how they complement and feed off each other. So let's give a warm welcome for Mark. Then. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, my speech doesn't have, actually it has way too much volume. Can you turn it down a little bit? Thanks. Um, my speech doesn't have any slides. I'd like to think that uh, you'll judge it on the merit of what I have to say. So just sit back and relax. And uh, I'll take you back to the beginning, the uh, earlier days when I first got my start online. Um, it's probably a story that not many of you have heard. Maybe some of you in the audience have been around in the early 1980s, uh, maybe not. Uh, but it was a very interesting time to be around. Computers were very simple back then. Uh, we had very small 8-bit computers, uh, very different from today's PCs and Macs. There were quite a wide variety of computers back then, microcomputers we called them. And it was very typical in those times to hook them up to a television set to use as your monitor. Um, getting online was, um, was uh, out of the ordinary in those times. Most people had no idea what that meant. Uh, there was no internet to speak of. There certainly wasn't any World Wide Web. Uh, it was a much simpler time. We uh, used uh, typically a 300 baud modem, uh, which is very slow by today's standards, uh, actually very quaint. Uh, it seemed fast when we first got online because we'd never experienced anything like that before. Also bear in mind that uh, the computers we were using, um, many of them didn't even have 80 columns on the screen. There were 32 columns or 40 columns, most of which didn't even have lowercase letters. So it was a, it was a very simple time to be online. Uh, my first experience getting online was actually using an information service known as CompuServe, which I do believe exists still in some shape or form uh, in the US, although those type of services aren't really that common anymore, uh, in, obviously, in the advent of the internet. Um, at that time, it was uh, an information service people would dial into to do such things as uh, talk on a, a chat room, which was the very first time I'd ever experienced that. They actually called it a, a CB at that time um, because I guess people knew what a CB was. They didn't know what a chat room was. So you would go on CompuServe to use the CB and chat with other people uh, anywhere in the country. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, you could also look up various kinds of information, uh, news, um, and also uh, what I was interested in, certainly at first, was locating people that had the same computer that I did, um, certainly to trade information, technical information, uh, maybe uh, trade programs, and so on. Uh, in those days, it was not common to get all the technical data uh, of your computer when you bought it. Most of that was left to you as a mystery to figure out. Um, possibly taking books about programming out of the library, uh, things of that sort. Um, just prior to getting my own computer, my first brush with them was at the local shopping center. Uh, now at this point in time, I'm talking about roughly 1980. Um, video game consoles were extremely popular. Uh, Atari, the Atari 2600 had been out for several years now and was probably the most popular gaming system that there ever was. There were very simple ones prior to that, made up of extremely simple black and white block graphics. Um, Atari was the first uh, video game console that actually looked somewhat like uh, an arcade game. Uh, it took cartridges and so on and me and my friends would swap we got interested in computers when computers came out because they were introduced right alongside the video game consoles in department stores, uh, sort of to sell right alongside televisions. It was very common uh, in those times to find uh, video game systems right alongside a TV in the audio video department of a department store. And naturally, that's where they rolled out microcomputers. Now, initially, uh, me and my friends thought if we could 
master programming, we could create our own video games. And that was initially what our main motivation was for learning how to program and understanding computers was really just to make video games. Um, now, again, bear in mind, we were probably about uh, nine years old, maybe 10. Uh, so, of course, we weren't thinking about this in any sort of business sense. Uh, in actuality, there really was no computer business then. There was no industry to speak of. Most of these computers were manufactured by companies uh, as for, for home entertainment, really. Uh, there wasn't really any kind of uh, word processing you could do with them. That, was, uh, that really didn't exist yet, hadn't really come about yet. And it would be extremely difficult to do word processing on a computer that only had maybe 32 columns and no lowercase. So that was completely out of the question. The uh, first computer that I got was actually a, a TRS-80, uh, which is a computer manufactured by uh, an electronics store, uh, relatively well known in the United States, uh, called Radio Shack. And this type of computer was released uh, right alongside others that were popular in the day, such as uh, Commodore VIC-20, uh, the Timex Sinclair, uh, computers of that sort. Uh, they were relatively simple machines, as I said. Now, my first motivation, of course, was to learn how to program. And the way I set about to do this was in taking books out of the library uh, about basic programming, which uh, in those days was the only language your computer was able to understand. Um, after, after mastering BASIC, I discovered uh, what's known as machine language, uh, basically the ability to talk directly to the computer's CPU. Uh, this interested me a lot uh, because it had uh, a lot of power over BASIC, uh, not only in speed, but uh, in knowing that you're actually communicating directly with the machine and not going through any sort of middleman or interpreter, as they call the, uh, the BASIC interpreter. Um, getting online, uh, getting back to that, um, I was initially interested in finding people who had the same computer as me. Maybe they, they found out uh, some secrets about it, uh, tricks for doing graphics or sound effects and so on. And uh, sort of accidentally, I stumbled upon uh, the Computer Underground. Now, the Computer Underground wasn't really anything to speak of like it is now. It was relatively simple. Uh, there was a very loose affiliation of people that I found initially uh, via CompuServe uh, that were more or less interested in uh, pirating games. And in doing so, they had to figure out ways to stay on the telephone for long periods of time. And this led to the discovery of calling cards and the ability to circumvent uh, long distance charges. Um, this is sort of an indirect, uh, is it my indirect exposure to the computer underground on a very simple and fundamental level. At the time, I had a rotary dial telephone. And uh, in order to even use calling card services, you needed a touchtone phone. So I couldn't even take advantage of any of that. I wasn't really interested in that uh, anyways. Uh, what I did discover for the first time were bulletin board systems, BBSs. And I had this realization that CompuServe was not the only thing you could call with your modem. Because the instructions that came with your modem didn't really tell you about anything else. They told you about maybe one or two information services that existed at that time. In BBSs, I discovered uh, a whole other world. Now, BBSs are essentially a computer sitting, usually sitting in some teenager's room. But you don't know that. You think it's some magical box that you could dial into with your computer, uh, see messages that other people have left, possibly uh, add to them with your own, and then uh, disconnect. Now, you have, to, you have to remember that these BBSs had only one telephone line in most cases. So if somebody was using the BBS, they were free to stay on for uh, a good amount of time. And while they were using it, no one else could. Uh, it was only one user at a time could actually make use of the bulletin board. But uh, strangely enough, as it sounds, it was a very effective means of communication. And bulletin boards, as you were signing off of them and disconnecting, would often advertise other bulletin boards. And in this way, you would start taking notes. Again, it was uh, very exotic to have a printer in those days, so handwritten notes were very common. It's also not very common to have a disk drive. Uh, cassette drives were very common in the day. 
uh, much more inexpensive, and you would uh, load and store programs from the computer on uh, very typical audio tape. Um, so now, getting online and discovering BBSs, I noticed that while there were people who were interested in trading software, talking about programming, and so on, there were people who were discussing gaining access to other computers. And I thought this was a fascinating concept. Around that time, in the early 80s, uh, a movie was released in the United States called War Games. And uh, it talked about uh, a teenager from uh, the suburbs of Seattle, Washington, in the United States, using his home computer, also looking for video game software, accidentally gaining access to uh, Strategic Air Command in the United States. A little far-fetched of a story. But uh, the moral of the story in the end was that after all the trouble he had gotten into, the uh, artificial intelligence computer that was running uh, the North American uh, air defense uh, had kind of gotten out of control of the people that were running it. The moral of the story was to not become so dependent on technology that you lose sight of the human factor. And it's still one of my favorite movies, even though people tend not to remember the moral and tend to focus more on the fact that it was a hacker breaking into NORAD because it's a lot more exciting of a story. Um, but after seeing this movie, uh, it really it opened my eyes to the fact that uh, there was a whole other world besides these simple information services, and even a whole other world besides just bulletin boards and talking to other people. There were actual systems that belonged to corporations, and these systems were a lot more powerful than the computer that I had at home. And it's not like today where the computer you have is at least as powerful as the one some company has, sometimes even more so, depending on their budget and depending on yours. In those days, it was much different. Companies used mainframes and mini computers that were thousands of times more powerful than the little microcomputer you had in your room. So there was this genuine curiosity to seek out these systems and possibly use them to further my, my programming exploits and so on. Now, the interesting thing is the very first systems that I logged into did not belong to any large corporation or multinational was actually uh, systems, uh, mini computers, that were being run at local universities in Long Island, New York. Now, the interesting thing about that is uh, a lot of these had guest accounts. Um, now, guest accounts typically were freely given out to students, and sometimes those students would pass those accounts along with the phone number of the system on BBSs that they called. In those times, uh, most of the BBSs in New York were in uh, Long Island, which is a bit far removed from the city. Uh, it's actually a suburb of New York City. And um, in calling these uh, systems, I not only encountered other people, but I started to meet individuals who referred to themselves as hackers. Now, I was familiar with the term from, uh, from the movie War Games and from popular culture that was starting to sprout out. I discovered a book uh, that was actually called Hackers, written by uh, an author named Stephen Levy, uh, about the previous generation of uh, technological explorers and programmers uh, from the uh, 60s and 70s and so on. And uh, it was a big motivation for me to sort of continue in the spirit of uh, exploration. In those times, it's important to note that uh, hacking, per se, was not illegal in the United States. If you used a computer somehow to commit a crime, uh, for example, maybe robbing a bank or uh, causing destruction by uh, damaging the system and blocking legitimate users from accessing it, these were obviously crimes that could be applied to laws that already existed. It wasn't really necessary to create separate laws because it wasn't really happening very often, these, these types of crimes, it's very rare. And when they did happen, they would end up in the newspaper, and people usually didn't really understand them, so they would quickly disappear from people's memory. Uh, the movie War Games sort of uh, gave people a bit of concern about computers. But again, uh, it was so rare, the, the, that type of uh, culture, that it truly was underground. Today, we refer to the computer underground, but it's not very underground. It's very much above ground. Uh, here we are at a conference in Malaysia talking about it and I was flown 10,000 miles to do so. 
Um, so again, it's, it's certainly very above ground. Compared to those times, first getting online and discovering these mini computers at universities, I had access to programming languages that my small computer at home simply didn't have. This allowed me to take books out of the library for such program, uh, programming languages as, as Pascal and Fortran, uh, things that were being taught at universities in, in colleges. Uh, and again, I was uh, barely even a teenager yet at this time. So it gave me a very early exposure to uh, programming that I never would have had in school. Uh, in, in those days, it was completely unheard of to have computers in school. Um, I remember when I first got to middle school, um, talking about 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade in the United States, um, having maybe one computer for half a dozen classrooms would be out of the ordinary. So it was a very new thing at those times. The interesting thing is getting online and gaining access to some of these systems you would often meet the system administrator, and it was perfectly normal to become friends with them, which is a revolutionary concept, since in this day and age, uh, a hacker is typically looking to avoid the system administrator upon gaining entry to a system. In those times, it was the opposite, because he was the best guy to ask questions. Now, manuals to these systems were not widely available. You might have had a help system built into them. Maybe you could type help for a particular command and hopefully the computer would guide you a bit. But it's not like you could run out to the local Borders bookstore and buy a book about Unix or something like that. It simply didn't exist. These books were not available. Uh, and it was very rare even to find books about programming. Uh, there were maybe a handful available at the local library and almost none at the local bookstore. So in gaining guidance from these system administrators and whatever help was available on these systems, able to further my programming ability. And it was around this time now in calling BBSs that uh, I discovered one such BBS in, uh, again, in Long Island, New York, that I was told was a hangout spot for a hacker group. Now, I wasn't familiar with the concept of hackers congregating in any way, shape, or form. I always imagined it to be a very solo pursuit. Um, it was explained to me by others that I met that a hacker group was a loose affiliation of people, um, obviously teenagers in this case, um, who had never met each other and who only dealt with, uh, with each other using aliases, uh, much like I chose the alias fiber optics sometime later uh, because I saw it as a representation of the future and the future of technology, which is where I'd like to see myself. Now, in learning about this hacker group, which was called the Legion of Doom, sounded really, really ominous. It's a, almost a scary sounding name. Uh, I wanted to know more about this hacker group, and they seemed like the people that I'd want to get in touch with to find out what uh, gaining access to systems was all about, maybe trade some stories or, or passwords and so on. Now, it turned out to be a lot more difficult than I, than I thought to, uh, to find these people. They were extremely well hidden and very private. Although, uh, at that time, it was very common for these individuals to write text files. Text files in those days were the way to disseminate information to others uh, for the purposes of learning and even for the purposes of bragging. If you gained access to a system, it was uh, very common for the person to write a text file describing what they saw. Uh, Oftentimes, if somebody got their hands maybe on a manual uh, in a computer lab, they would type up pages from the manual with commands and release that as a text file on uh, one of these bulletin board systems for somebody to download. Um, so this was a very simple and crude form of uh, sharing technical information at that time. Now, there was also a lot of misinformation, and it was not done on purpose, but it was simply by people who wanted to brag and didn't really know any better. Uh, oftentimes, these text files contained incorrect information. Um, so it was very difficult to figure out how to separate what was real from what wasn't. Now, uh, in tracking down these guys, um, which I, I ultimately did, uh, I realized that uh, there was sort of a, uh, I guess I would call it a, a brotherhood of trust. Uh, this is, this is a, a predominantly male pursuit for whatever reason. And uh, I soon found that uh, even though these guys were really protective of their identity, 
um, if you showed them that you had some sort of promising skill, uh, they would take you into their inner circle and uh, sort of help you along and uh, even reveal who they were in real life. And it was, uh, it was at that point we got to speaking on the telephone, which was completely unheard of. Now, bear in mind that we don't really know if a lot of what we're doing is legal or not. Uh, for the first several years that we're doing this, there are no specific laws against it. Uh, as it turned out, in 1986, we would find out years after that uh, in 86, they had uh, actually uh, drafted several laws uh, in the United States um, against uh, computer fraud and abuse. And the majority of these laws had never been tested in those days. And of course, we being teenagers were completely unaware of this fact. So uh, we always like to think that what we were doing was either completely legal or, as we like to think, quasi-legal. We weren't really sure. But we weren't going to really lose any sleep over it because we considered our pursuit to be a noble one. We were uh, seeking to understand these machines and how to program them. And uh, one of our uh, most favorite things to explore at that time was uh, the telephone network, uh, being that it was probably the most advanced and fast-paced network in the world. Uh, that's where the majority of computer research was done outside of universities, uh, at Bell Labs in uh, New Jersey in the United States. There were revolutionary uh, concepts in computing that were uh, being developed, uh, specifically being applied to telecommunications. Uh, it was extremely interesting. So uh, obviously, in exploring the telephone network, we were gaining access to the cutting edge of technology as we saw it, uh, before corporations actually got to it. Now, in uh, gaining this access came a great deal of responsibility. Now, the way that I saw it, at least, the way that I remember it, uh, the, this hacker group, uh, among others, and there were several, but uh, this particular one, the Legion of Doom, sort of uh, stood out in that it was uh, one of the first attempts to unify hackers um, and sort of uh, get them to do productive things. Uh, and obviously, destructive things were frowned upon, uh, deleting data, destroying systems, denying access, and so on. Um, they and I myself as well prided ourselves in gaining access to a system and leaving it in as pristine shape as we possibly could uh, during the course of exploring it and, and learning from it, which is the, the same type of manners, honestly, that we learned in accessing these uh, university systems, which were, in essence, really completely open to, uh, to students. So uh, when we did actually gain access to systems that belong to corporations, um, it's interesting to note that many of these didn't have passwords. Uh, it was not mandatory, certainly not by law, and uh, just uh, culturally, it was not very common uh, to have a password on even a very important uh, data system. Uh, there were very common default logins and passwords, uh, which became known in the computer underground as things to try when you discovered a system. And more often than not, you would simply gain access with a login alone and no password at all. Uh, so again, even if it was illegal, which it became years later, if you're not using a password, it's questionable if it's even illegal or, or not. There were certainly no notices on the system telling you you shouldn't be there. One moment you weren't there, and the next moment you were simply logged in, just like any other user. And provided that you conducted yourself online in a polite way and uh, used the system to, to your advantage without damaging it, then uh, there was really no harm done. And uh, we didn't really have any problem with this. And for several years, no one else uh, really did either. Um, around that time, I discovered that there was a very prominent magazine, uh, a hacker journal of sorts, called 2600 Magazine. Um, I found out that they had an actual face-to-face -face meeting at Citicorp Center in Manhattan. And uh, I was very curious about this. And uh, I actually called a friend of mine and we set out to go down there and meet some of these people. Uh, now, uh, it was not what I expected in the least bit. While I had become accustomed to uh, speaking on the phone with uh, Legion of Doom members and, and so on, and on BBSs as well, 
Uh, meeting people in person was a completely different affair. Uh, people were extremely paranoid, worried about getting uh, caught by federal agents and so on, uh, or, or even being photographed. It was a very small group of people at that time, talking about certainly less than a dozen people uh, in the food court of, uh, of uh, corporate headquarters of Citicorp. Um, what, was, uh, what was still prevalent, though, is, is the willingness to share information despite the risk. And that's a, a recurring theme that you'll notice over the lifetime of the computer underground, is despite great personal risk, People can and do share information with each other, even if some of that information would tend to be illegal, or possibly even the use of that information. Um, it's, it's a, I, I find it to be uh, psychologically very interesting that people would put the technology and the pursuit of it uh, first and before a uh, threat to their own personal freedom. Um, now, uh, in meeting people at 2600, uh, I thought that this was not the way I wanted things to be. There shouldn't be this sort of paranoia. There should be a, a lot more openness in discussing the technology. And I set about to do interviews uh, wherever I could, uh, which was uh, not very common in those times. There was not very much media coverage of computers in general, never mind the computer underground. And when any sort of hacking activity was mentioned in the media, it was typically negative. And it was just to cover a story that uh, perhaps uh, a couple of teenagers were arrested for uh, causing some mischief uh, in some corporation's computer. They did something wrong and they got noticed and so on. Um, so I set out to sort of uh, clear the air and show that someone could be well-spoken and technically proficient. And uh, I, I didn't necessarily see myself as the, uh, the voice box of the computer underground, but uh, I didn't... I, didn't want, I certainly didn't want anyone doing the talking for me, let's put it that way. If I was going to pursue an activity which certainly could be misconstrued, uh, I needed to clear the air personally and make sure that my motives were understood by those who could possibly cause me harm in the process. Now, some of the uh, first interviews that I did um, were for uh, college-type interviews at a local university, New York University. I did several interviews of that nature. Um, and uh, through going to 2600, eventually, uh, media people began showing up there. And uh, it was almost as if you had to learn how to deal with the media so that they wouldn't twist your words around and uh, make uh, you know, some, some crazy story about it. it basically, to take advantage of what you were saying, uh, and, and completely misconstrue what the point was. So uh, it was uh, interesting that not, not only did you have to learn how to, uh, how to deal with, with uh, technical people that would show up at 2600 meeting, but also how to deal with the media, uh, if, if in fact you even wanted to talk to them at all, which many people simply shun them. But again, I wanted to get a message out, so uh, I had to learn to deal with them. And at first, I did have a lot of bad interviews. I was able to turn that around and ultimately use the media to my advantage. Uh, certainly later on when I myself came under fire and got into legal trouble for hacking, having friends in the media was extremely valuable uh, all throughout my legal trouble because uh, it provided me with the means to counter what the U.S. government was saying about me, uh, much of which was not true uh, as far as the things that I had allegedly done and people that I was allegedly involved with. So having friends in the media wa uh, proved to be extremely useful. Um, the uh, first conferences that I was actually invited to, uh, now we're talking in uh, probably in the, uh, towards the late 80s, there was uh, this uh, beginnings of a security industry, very beginning. Uh, a lot of it was motivated by virus research, computer viruses. Uh, computer viruses were a lot more of a threat, at least to the corporate world in those times, than hackers ever were. They were certainly a lot more destructive. Uh, the payloads of these computer viruses uh, would typically do things like uh, delete someone's files, uh, make the computer inoperable, and so on. Now, uh, in these times still, it was not very common for a business computer, uh, at least one that was on a person's desk, to, to even have a hard drive. 
Um, the more exotic ones did, but most of them simply operated by floppy disk, five and a quarter inch floppy disk which was the medium and the mechanism by which computer viruses traveled in those times. Uh, a computer disk would have some program uh, seemingly innocuous. Um, it could even be some application, a word processor, or something of that, something of that nature, with uh, a virus payload actually hidden within it so that when the person willingly executed the program, it's sort of like a Trojan horse type attack, the, uh, the virus would replicate itself uh, onto the person's computer, if it had a hard drive, and wait for someone to insert a fresh floppy disk to which it would copy itself onto. And the virus would travel uh, in this way. One of the earliest conferences I was invited to was at the World Trade Center in New York, and it was called the uh, International Virus and Security Conference. At that time, I was the only underground hacker at the conference. Um, so I was sort of uh, viewed as uh, a bit of an enemy of sorts. Um, many of the people there doing their so-called research had never seen a hacker in real life uh, and I think were uh, quite surprised to have a very casual conversation with one. Um, it was uh, an, an interesting mix of people. Uh, there were people from uh, as far away as, as Iceland, uh, certainly uh, various places in Europe, which, which I, I would have expected. There was certainly a, a lot of research being done uh, Germany, uh, and so on. Uh, they seemed to be a bit ahead of uh, the research that was being done in the United States at that time. The industry was extremely simple. Um, so we had this uh, loose affiliation, again, uh, not unlike the loose affiliation of the Legion of Doom, a loose affiliation of virus and security experts meeting at the World Trade Center and looking to share information with a very similar motivation. And um, I was actually greeted uh, very well, ultimately, when these, uh, these so-called experts realized that I was not a threat, and uh, I became very popular at the conference. Uh, the security people wanted to hear what I had to say, and likewise, I wanted to hear what, what they had to say uh, about what they thought. And this sort of sharing of information from both sides of the fence uh, proved to be uh, very useful, uh, I thought. Uh, unfortunately, it was not to be. And uh, certainly in this day and age, the sharing of information between the computer underground and uh, the security industry uh, tends to be something uh, that's still very precarious at best. Um, I myself uh, deal with both sides, the, the underground and the security industry, being that these days uh, I'm a security consultant. But uh, let's go back a little bit and talk about how I got started doing that. Um, Around the time that I was uh, gaining some prominence in doing interviews and even speaking engagements about the computer underground, uh, I began uh, getting job offers from some of the first internet service providers in New York City. Now, bear in mind that back then, an internet service provider was not some huge multinational corporation. The internet had just been discovered by uh, the technically proficient people uh, people that were accustomed to calling BBSs, certainly BBSs that had nothing to do with the computer underground, but uh, BBSs that were more concerned with uh, people simply meeting other people uh, and uh, talking about topics of interest and so on. These were the types of people who wanted to check out the Internet and see what it was all about. Prior to that, it was known as the ARPANET. Uh, it was restricted primarily to uh, U.S. government, uh, research and development, and major technical universities. Uh, the general public, at least, had no exposure to it whatsoever. And it would still be several years before the World Wide Web was developed. Um, so now, in, in getting some of my first technical jobs at these ISPs, um, it was really my first exposure to the internet and to the hardware and software necessary to connect the corporation to it. Uh, so I got a lot of experience in this. Um, it was around this time that uh, I was approached by a gentleman who worked for uh, a large uh, accounting firm, uh, which uh, is known as Ernst & Young. And uh, Ernst & Young, as uh, was uh, several of the other uh, accounting and auditing firms in the United States, uh, which I was to find out, was extremely interested in including computer security services 
as a follow-on to their uh, audits. Now, it was very common for them to go into a large corporation that they had as a client, a Fortune 500 company, and uh, go down a checklist for um, what was known as best practices. Uh, what would, uh, for example, uh, within the, the IT infrastructure, um, doing such things as uh, you know, choosing strong passwords, uh, you know, all that sort of boring stuff that I'm sure you're all very much familiar with. Um, now, what they were interested in doing is, as a follow-on to that, simply uh, doing an auditing checklist, is having computer experts come in and uh, actually try to break into their systems sort of in a, uh, a controlled exercise to simulate what it would be like to, to have a, uh, hackers or some unknown forces, let's say, whether they be uh, corporate spies or so on. Um, and in this way, the management of the corporation could uh, test the readiness of their IT staff. Now, um, you're probably thinking that this sounds all very basic. This sort of thing happens all the time these days. It didn't then. And uh, in the uh, mid to late 90s, this was extremely revolutionary. Uh, the only sorts of people that had ever done any sorts of readiness testing by staging a live attack prior to these times uh, was uh, the US military. And they referred to it as uh, tiger teams. And it wasn't just to assess the readiness of, of computer systems. They even did this to assess the readiness of troops who were guarding uh, very important military installations. Um, they would often have uh, people posing as uh, persons of authority to try to trick the guards of the military installation to gain access to restricted areas. And uh, their superior would simply in instruct them to leave evidence that could later be retrieved that they were able to penetrate the restricted area. Uh, in the spirit of that, uh, we adopted the term Tiger Team similarly. And uh, Tiger Team, or penetration study, uh, penetration analysis, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, became uh, a huge success. Um, I was actually invited to bring in uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, good friends that I've known for years, from the computer underground. And uh, I would probably have to say that Ernst & Young was uh, one of the first companies to actually do this, uh, to invite members of the computer underground uh, who were trusted and could be trusted to uh, take part in these uh, controlled simulations. And we actually prided ourselves in our own success because uh, certainly we were so accustomed to bragging in the computer underground about our exploits. Now here was a chance to actually prove to the corporate world that uh, we really were as skilled as we were saying we were. And uh, so there was a certainly a, a large amount of pride that we had to preserve uh, in not only in performing a responsible and a good job, but also in gaining access to whatever the goal was. And there was always a set goal. We would typically meet with the, uh, the management and certainly the upper management of a large company. Uh, and we would keep it very quiet because you don't want the employees to know that this sort of training exercise is going on. Uh, even though it's a simulation, you want them to believe that it's real so that the management can assess how they're going to respond in this sort of situation. So we stress that fact to upper management. Now, what we would typically do is describe exactly what we were about to do, uh, which in many cases amounted to getting a hotel within the vicinity of, uh, of the corporation, uh, showing up with a bunch of laptop computers, and getting some phone lines in the hotel room, and uh, scan for modems, uh, do some social engineering of employees to find out internal information. We always uh, approach the attack from a zero-knowledge perspective to give the most value to the corporation. Uh, we would always tell them that we did not want any information whatsoever other, simp other than simply the company name and maybe possibly where they had branch offices located. Uh, they might tell us that they didn't want us to touch a particular department or a particular branch office, and that was fine. But in most cases, uh, we were given permission to completely assess the entire corporation. Uh, typically, over, over a week's time was very common. Um, after which uh, we had reached our goal of gaining access to some 
corporate mainframe or, or database, uh, we would present our findings. And um, I can say that there was always a, a lot of shock and surprise, but uh, the companies were always very satisfied with our work. And it was during these times that I tried to get as many uh, of my computer underground friends uh, involved in this type of business. I thought it was a business that we were very well suited to, and uh, I didn't want to see other people falling by the wayside and getting into trouble with the government and so on, as I had. Uh, I had uh, a lot of friends who were good people, and I didn't want to see them getting into the sorts of trouble that I did. Um, it's definitely not necessary. It's something I could have uh, I could have done without, but it was what it was, and I tend to think that I, I used the attention at least to my advantage. But uh, so my start with with Ernst and Young was in uh, in actually doing this sort of tiger teaming, and uh, we developed this as initially a follow-on to uh, traditional auditing. It became so wildly popular that we were being requested by other Ernst and Young branch offices throughout the United States uh, to specifically us, the New York team. Uh, to come and do a Tiger team for a client of theirs. And it actually completely reversed, where uh, a client would request a Tiger team first, and oftentimes Ernst & Young would get follow-on auditing work. So uh, our work actually became more popular than the traditional auditing. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the main office for Ernst & Young was not New York. It was actually in Columbus, Ohio. The fact that it was not their idea and that it was ours in New York, there was lots of uh, political problems within the company about who was going to run this. Um, so ultimately, rather than, than getting embroiled in a whole uh, political uh, bureaucratic mess uh, at this company, uh, it was becoming extremely popular uh, to provide this service to companies. So uh, some, some very close friends of mine along with myself, we, we formed a consulting firm of our own. Uh, we were three partners, and uh, we called ourselves uh, Crossbar Security. And uh, we set about doing the same type of consulting that we did for Ernst & Young, uh, in a nutshell, providing uh, Tiger teams, simulated break-ins, uh, as well as um, uh, analyses, uh, sitting down with IT staff, uh, interviewing them as far as what their methods and practices were. Uh, and uh, this type of work was extremely successful. Uh, we did business in uh, both North and South America, in Scandinavia, and even as far away as Japan. And along with this type of tiger teaming and penetration studies, uh, I was often invited to do speaking engagements, much like I am now. And I was really able to hone my skills as a public speaker uh, in talking to audiences of, of all sizes sometimes speaking frankly, as I am now, and, and telling stories, and other times in uh, discussing highly technical things. Um, what was interesting about the, uh, the industry uh, in, in Tokyo is worth mentioning, that uh, they didn't really believe that uh, hackers were a threat. They certainly didn't believe that there was really a such thing as a corporate spy either, um, which was... Uh, made it very difficult for us to sell our services. Um, I think it's uh, more due to a cultural thing than anything else. They tended to think that uh, their employees would respect their managers and so would not be interested in any way in defrauding them. Uh, of course, this was completely untrue, unfortunately. Um, I was invited at one point to actually do a live penetration on stage in Tokyo to uh, a large technical audience from a variety of corporations. And uh, the, uh, I, I probably shouldn't say who the target corporation was, but it was a very large electronics corporation in Tokyo. Uh, I was given permission to hack one particular department at the company. Um, I was given, uh, at that time it was very popular, ISDN access on stage uh, in, in lieu of broadband access. It was very common at the time. Um, I had a laptop that I had previously set up for the task, uh, which was connected to a uh, projection screen, much like this. And I actually demonstrated live, uh, which many people had never seen, and probably today many people have never seen, uh, how it is you go about using scanning tools and so on uh, to discover the weaknesses in a particular corporation's department. 
um, finding the weak points in that department and exploiting them, uh, identifying what the operating systems were that were in use, and uh, gaining access ultimately, which I did on stage, um, probably took about 20 minutes to half an hour. And uh, unfortunately, I found out afterwards, since there was a, an audience poll uh, to gauge the, the interest for this type of work, uh, the, the so-called uh, penetration studies. Uh, unfortunately, the audience, while they found it very entertaining, they didn't believe it was real. They thought that we were putting on a show. They didn't think that it was so easy that someone could come from New York into uh, this highly technical environment, and within about 20 minutes to half an hour's time, uh, break into a very large and powerful electronic uh, conglomerate. So um, it was very difficult doing security work in, uh, in Tokyo. I actually uh, did much better business uh, doing speaking engagements and talking about security than actually doing security work. Um, hopefully that's changed. Uh, I, I can't honestly say I've been in Tokyo in the past several years. Uh, the last time I was there, I believe, was in 2000 or 2001. Uh, I can only hope that things have changed for the better since then. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point now, uh, around the time that uh, we call the, uh, the dot-com bust in the United States, when a um, majority of these uh, technology companies began going bankrupt, uh, simply because they didn't really produce anything. Many of them didn't actually have a product or even a service. Uh, they were simply maybe selling access, perhaps they were an information portal of sorts, and they sustained themselves, at least initially, by selling advertisement space. Now, unfortunately, their operating costs were much larger than whatever they were getting by selling advertisement space on a website. Uh, so now we're talking in the, uh, the early 2000s uh, in the United States, and uh, these companies were beginning to fail. Um, now, it was unfortunate being that many of these companies were my clients. So, in essence, my business began to fail. And it, uh, it led to us having to fold crossbar security and go back into private practice, which uh, off and on is where I've remained to this day as an independent security consultant. Uh, it was a very difficult time actually getting over that period. Um, but ultimately, it was, uh, it was for the best, and uh, I'm certainly doing some really good security work once more. Um, one thing that I've learned from that is uh, not to be so dependent on any one country's uh, economy. Uh, certainly, uh, in dealing with the IT companies, the industry is very volatile, and uh, these days I've been keeping my interests a lot more global uh, in uh, in, in an effort to stay ahead. Um, it's around this time also that the security industry itself, while having a very promising beginning, uh, began to decline, uh, at least in the United States, and I was certainly noticing this in certain other markets. Um, corporations were losing interest in security. It was expensive. There were way too many products to choose from. In fact, the industry was flooded with security products claiming to do uh, all sorts of ridiculous things. Uh, intrusion detection, which to this day I think is very ridiculous. Um, people should be trained to detect intruders and not trust in the fact that they have a small appliance on a rack in a data center uh, to detect intruders. But uh, all sorts of products of this nature were really gaining popularity in the industry and really flooded the industry without giving uh, customers, uh, corporate customers, any, any clear path to follow in deciding what products to use. Uh, any particular salesman's story was just as good as any others. Uh, and so that they were getting uh, their budgets cut. Uh, it wasn't so clear cut anymore how to spend your security budget. So they simply had too much left over uh, at the end of the fiscal year, having not spent it on anything. So naturally, this budget was cut and used for more productive things. Uh, and whereas previously in many large corporations you had a uh, security officer or at least someone in a managerial role who was responsible for security, this role completely evaporated. 
Uh, most of the corporations I deal with to this day have no more security officer or responsible security person, and, which blows my mind. Because uh, if I'm brought in to do a security job, the first thing I ask is to meet with the director of security. And uh, I often discover that there is no such person. And large corporations uh, are more or less uh, self-governing when it comes to security. They may have some uh, checklist that they develop, or maybe just the, uh, the loose affiliation of systems administrators who really run the, the IT department and who are always in a really bad mood. Uh, sort of uh, govern the company by being in a bad mood. And if somebody does something wrong, they, they yell at them and tell them not to do it again uh, without really understanding possibly why it was bad to do such a thing. Uh, and uh, the companies have uh, continued to exist in that way. Um, the security industry itself, I think, is largely to blame for this by not giving anyone any clear path to follow. Uh, most of the security journals, and there are quite a few, um, are more concerned with advertising products than they are in actually presenting uh, important research. The majority of security research, uh, at least, is available on the internet, but unfortunately, most of the managers and IT staff in companies don't have time to read the information. Um, so, uh, and also on the part of security consultants, uh, there's a problem in that uh, these consultants are really presenting uh, an air of uh, fear and uncertainty uh, in order to sell their consulting services or to sell a particular security product. Um, it seems to be uh, a lot about money, which uh, most industries are, but uh, at least the security industry was less about that when it first came about in uh, the United States. It was more about a sense of exploration and understanding, much as the development of the computer underground was. But there's been uh, a definite rift in the direction of everybody's got to start a security company, everybody's got to release a security product of, of some form, uh, and it's all about making money, and there's no real free discussion going on anymore. Um, everything is very hush-hush and top secret. Security companies don't really want to deal with each other or let, let the, uh, the competition know what they're working on. There are still some exceptions. Uh, most of those exceptions are security firms that were started by former hackers, whether their clients are aware of it or not. Um, certainly, these hackers may not have gotten into any trouble with the law, so they can, they can more easily uh, hide the fact that they were ever involved in the computer underground at all. Um, but there is still some respectability to the industry. Um, I would probably consider the uh, computer security industry here in Malaysia to be a relatively young one. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, the, uh, the stories I'm telling will give you sort of a, an air of caution about what not to do. Uh, there's certainly a lot of promise when you haven't made all the same mistakes yet, and hopefully you will never make, um, as far as uh, really uh, flooding the industry with uh, this information in, uh, in the hopes that you'll simply get a customer. Um, I think that in working together, just as we tried to in the uh, late 80s and, and early 90s in uh, sort of organizing an international uh, affiliation of security experts uh, between people in the underground and, uh, and computer professionals, I think we should return to that spirit of uh, sharing of information, because certainly in, uh, in the sharing, uh, there's a lot less paranoia. The, the experts are not wondering what the hackers are up to, or vice versa. And uh, certainly, we can uh, further the exploration of, of this technology in, uh, in opening this dialogue. And uh, we can hope that the, uh, the software engineers in the large corporations will patch the, uh, the problems in uh, hardware and software that we're finding the exploits in. Because uh, this is really the true threat to, uh, to our infrastructure. Um, I'd uh, welcome anyone to uh, speak with me afterwards uh, as far as uh, how we can uh, hopefully improve the security infrastructure of Malaysia. 
since uh, it's a very new thing for me. This is my first time in this country, and uh, I'm certainly enjoying it, and uh, I hope I'll be coming back in the future to uh, join you again. Uh, thank you for the time. Deception Group. Now, uh, what he's going to talk about today will be the rise and fall of information security in the Western world. And to quote his words, right, you are invited to join him in not a speech but a verbal odyssey, okay? Back to the beginnings of each of these all important cultural developments, how directly and indirectly um, the, the hacker underground and the computer security industry, how they complement and feed off each other. So let's give a warm welcome for Mark then. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, my speech doesn't have, actually it has way too much volume. Can you turn it down a little bit? Thanks. Um, my speech doesn't have any slides. I'd like to think that uh, you'll judge it on the merit of what I have to say. So just sit back and relax. And uh, I'll take you back to the beginning, the uh, earlier days when I first got my start online. Um, it's probably a story that not many of you have heard. Maybe some of you in the audience have been around in the early 1980s, uh, maybe not. Uh, but it was a very interesting time to be around. Computers were very simple back then. Uh, we had very small 8-bit computers, uh, very different from today's PCs and Macs. There were quite a wide variety of computers back then, microcomputers we called them. And it was very typical in those times to hook them up to a television set to use as your monitor. Um, getting online was, um, was uh, out of the ordinary in those times. Most people had no idea what that meant. Uh, there was no internet to speak of. There certainly wasn't any World Wide Web. Uh, it was a much simpler time. We uh, used uh, typically a 300 baud modem, uh, which is very slow by today's standards, uh, actually very quaint. Uh, it seemed fast when we first got online because we'd never experienced anything like that before. Also, bear in mind that uh, the computers we were using, um, many of them didn't even have 80 columns on the screen. There were 32 columns or 40 columns, most of which didn't even have lowercase letters. So it was a, it was a very simple time to be online. Uh, my first experience getting online was actually using an information service known as CompuServe, which I do believe exists still in some shape or form. Uh, in the US, although those type of services aren't really that common anymore, uh, in, obviously in the advent of the internet. Um, at that time, it was uh, an information service people would dial into to do such things as uh, talk on a, a chat room, which was the very first time I'd ever experienced that. They actually called it a, a CB at that time, um, because I guess people knew what a CB was. They didn't know what a chat room was. So you would go on CompuServe to use the CB and chat with other people uh, anywhere in the country. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, you could also look up various kinds of information, uh, news, um, and also uh, what I was interested in certainly at first was locating people that had the same computer that I did, um, certainly to trade information, technical information, uh, maybe uh, trade programs and so on. Uh, in those days, it was not common to get all the technical data uh, of your computer when you bought it. Most of that was left to you as a mystery to figure out. Um, possibly taking books about programming out of the library, uh, things of that sort. Um, just prior to getting my own computer, my first brush with them was at the local shopping center. Uh, now, at this point in time, I'm talking about roughly 1980. Um, video game consoles were extremely popular. Uh, Atari, the Atari 2600, had been out for several years now and was probably the most popular gaming system that there ever was. There were very simple ones prior to that, made up of extremely simple black and white block graphics. Um, Atari was the first uh, video game console that actually looked somewhat like uh, an arcade game. 
uh, took cartridges and so on, and me and my friends would swap. We got interested in computers when computers came out because they were introduced right alongside the video game consoles in department stores, uh, sort of to sell right alongside televisions. It was very common uh, in those times to find uh, video game systems right alongside a TV in the audio video department of a department store. And naturally, that's where they rolled out microcomputers. Now, initially, uh, me and my friends thought if we could master programming, we could create our own video games. And that was initially what our main motivation was for learning how to program and understanding computers was really just to make video games. Um, now, again, bear in mind, we were probably about uh, nine years old maybe 10. Uh, so, of course, we 